Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Adrian Johnson, and I am the host of Artist Proof Redux. Thanks so much for checking in today for this episode. And this is the first episode of what will probably be a very tentative uh, series um, that I'll be starting. Um, basically, I'm just taking old episodes from my belated podcast, Artist Proof with Adrian Johnson, and where possible, going in and finding places where I can expand on the context of what was discussed um, through images, um, pictures, just anything that I I feel, you know, would help get that point across and make the episode a bit more interesting, you know, because recently I had a chance to go back and start listening uh, to those episodes as recorded. And, you know, a lot of them, you know, are very good. You know, this some things are kind of shaky, of course, <laughs> you know, but for the most part, I, I still really like them. And I thought that they would kind of benefit, at least a few of them would kind of benefit from, you know, having some additional images put in them just to give more context and, you know, really f round out the presentation of that particular episode. And the first episode that I wanted to give this treatment to was my conversation with comic book artist John Bogdanov. Bogdanov is one of my favorite comic book artists, uh, just for a number of reasons. Uh, foremost, um, I just really enjoy his work. Uh, his figures, his figure work is just superb. You know, it's chunky, it's blocky, it's powerful. It's very much reminiscent, as we discussed in the episode, of artists like uh, Walt Simonson or a more prominently a uh, Jack Kirby. And, you know, I, I've just always loved this work um, since I first saw it when I was a kid back in, I believe it was about 1993, if I'm not mistaken, uh, right around the time or in the wake of the return, the death and return of Superman storyline that DC was putting out. And, you know, I, I got his book with the uh, character Steel, uh, John Henry Irons, and that book for me, you know, really made me a fan. And out of all the books, you know, from that storyline, the Death of Superman storyline, the Death and Return, rather, it was Bogdanov's that I kept coming back to um, just because of his work and because of the Steel character. So it was great to get a chance to talk with John, you know, about the uh, creation of that character with uh, writer Luis Simonson. And he also discusses as well. Just moreover, his influences as far as like art making and even outside of art as well. You know, one of his biggest influences uh, is actually the uh, old Superman TV show with uh, George Reeves as the titular character. And he discusses how that was an influence on not only his work, but his life as well. And then we talk about several other things that I think you guys will find very fascinating uh, if you have not heard the episode before. Now, the episode is... As it originally aired, I believe it's still available on iTunes. Uh, I would almost recommend that you do not track that down. <laughs> and the reason for that is, is that, like I said, you know, um, it, I, when I listened back to it, the preamble was kind of shaky. You know, a lot of, um, uh, 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 you know, a lot of that type of thing. So, you know, for this for these new episodes, these new presentations, I'm actually recording uh, new beginnings and new endings uh, for them as well, uh, just to kind of clean those up a bit. So, yeah, if if you could, you know, try to avoid <laughs> avoid those. Um, I won't be doing every episode. Every episode will not be getting this redux treatment, you know, um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is very intensive, just to um, study and find the suitable images and context uh, to put into the episode. Like, I really want this stuff uh, to be highly accurate for posterity, you know. So there is a lot of research that goes into this. And um, for this particular episode here, you know, there are a couple of things that uh, Bogdanov mentioned that once I went back and found examples of what he was talking about, you know, really enlightened me. You know, just as far as, uh, in particular, um, one of his influences for uh, John Henry Irons was a old uh, stop motion animation um, that I'd never heard of called John Henry and the Inky Poo uh, and was written and directed by George Powell. And now George Powell 
actually was also the director of the classic War of the Worlds movie from 1952, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I had no idea that Powell had actually written and directed this particular short. So when you see the example in here, it's like it's remarkable for a number of reasons, as you'll see, you know, not just for the animation, but for also the fact that all of the characters in there were actually black, you know, and not that stereotypical black that you would find, you know, being represented at the time, you know, so it's very refreshing and highly enlightening. So, you know, like I said, I want this stuff to be historically accurate and I want it to stand up for posterity for whomever may see these episodes going forward. So anyway, enough of all that. Let's get to this episode. This is Artist Proof Redux and this is my conversation with John Bogdanov. Um, let, let's start kind of back from the beginning, you know, sure. just in terms of where did your um, interest in, you know, comics come from, comics and cartooning, but also if there were other factors that led into it as well uh, to your interest? Well, um, <clears throat> to some extent, art is probably uh, somewhat in my blood because uh, my grandfather was a painter and a muralist mm. um, uh, back in the early part of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. um, I unfortunately died long before I was born, but one of my earliest memories, you know, one of those, those half-remembered things you have from childhood, I sort of remember lying on my back on the bed, uh, probably my parents' bed, I guess, mm -hmm. um, uh, as a baby, I think, and uh, looking up and seeing, um, seeing one of my grandfather's paintings on the wall above the bed, and in my imagination, climbing through the the frame into the world of, of palette knife colors wow. uh, beyond. And that might have been just the start uh, in my mind that that uh, that uh, you can make pictures. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but I think the the real motivating factor uh, for me was I, when I was a kid, the uh, the old Adventures of Superman TV show yeah. was in reruns all around the country. This is their early 60s. And I used to watch that thing religiously. I would, you know, tie a towel around my neck and go flying around the neighborhood and, and run home from kindergarten just in time to flip on the TV and then lie down on top of the oak table with my arms outstretched and, and fly through the episode. <laughs> uh, and and I, I, I really, I think I was very strongly influenced by, I mean, that show is very uneven. It's, you know, you look, if you look back at it today, it's sort of mind-bogglingly simple-minded. Mm -hmm. But to a five-year-old of my generation, um, George Reeves' portrayal of Superman transcends even the dumbest scripts on that show. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of those episodes, like the first two seasons, they still hold up. But, but the thing that carries it through and the thing that makes it worth uh, um, new fans uh, taking a look at is that um, George had a very sort of fatherly, yes. friendly, gentlemanly, uh, portrayal of Superman. Mm -hmm. You know, he wasn't an angst-ridden uh, uh, teenager. He wasn't uh, a godlike alien. He was uh, a man. And as such, he was a role model for me and I think, you know, millions of other guys of my generation. Definitely. But anyway, that's, that's, I think, the, that's the, I think, the start, certainly in my obsession with Superman. I, I you know, the... I was a I was a kid with the towel tied around his neck, jumping off the neighbor's carport into the into the pile of leaves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the standard story, the standard story I always say is is you know after the tenth or twelfth uh, time uh, pain of uh, after the tenth or twelfth painful landing, mm. I I decided to take up drawing it instead. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that, that's what they say about flying, you know, the hard part is always the landing, so. It's always the landing, yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's like, well, you jump off a cliff, you know? Right. Uh, uh, 
So far, so good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's that's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. Well, well uh, and then and then I guess with um, I started I started reading comic books. Well, I, I mean, as a kid, I would see comic books occasionally. Mm-hmm. Um, my access to them was limited, uh, um, as my access to funds was limited, but, yeah. but, uh, um, other kids at school would have comics and occasionally I would get some money together and buy comics. They were only, you know, 12 cents in those days. Mm. Um, and, uh, um, I, of course I bought, I bought Superman because that was my introduction to the whole concept of, of superheroes and the whole world of, of superhero myth. Yeah. Um, but I was never that. I, I was. I was always a little bit disappointed by the comic books. Hmm. I know that there are a lot of people who love, absolutely love, the Silver Age Superman stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but to me, a, as a seven-year-old, as an eight-year-old, I thought there was just an awful lot of uh, silliness around. You know. Is Lois going to discover his secret identity? Is Jimmy Olsen in drag? Is Superman? <laughs> why is Superman eating five thousand hamburgers? You know uh, what kind of what kind of red kryptonite Michigas is going on here? There's not a lot of that kind of thing. And for my bloodthirsty seven year old taste, not enough of hitting bad guys. Right. <laughs> you know, I wanted Superman. I wanted Superman to bust through the wall, uh, bounce some bullets off of his chest. Knock some guys out, and you know, save Lois and Jimmy. That was that was my that was my concept of Superman. Was sort of dad coming to the rescue, mm. um, and and I always and you know I even at seven I realized that you were limited with what you could do in television, but I I thought that in comics he should be able to punch giant robots. He should be able to hit dinosaurs and things. And and um, uh, it wasn't really until I came across the Fleischer cartoon, mm, mm-hmm. which is some years later, uh, and there really is an episode where he fights giant robots. There really is an episode where he fights a dinosaur. So, so uh, I, I knew it was out there, man. You know, I, knew it, <laughs> I knew that stuff was happening somewhere. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and it was very gratifying to find it. But as as a kid, I was I, I mean I bought Superman religiously, but I always was a little bit disappointed by uh, what was going on in that. And then at some point, um, I stumbled across my first Marvel comic. Mm. And it was, I can tell you which one it was because uh, it didn't made that much of an impression. Wow. Um, it was, I think, Ditko's final issue of Spider Man. That's how late I, I, I joined up. It was a story named um, Just a Guy Named Joe. Yes. Mm-hmm. I think that was right at the end of his run. Uh, and uh, it, of course, it blew my mind. As, it, as Marvel sort of blew, was blowing everybody's minds mm-hmm. back then, it just it blew my mind. And uh, and so, uh, you know, I quickly got this idea that there's Marvel Comics and that there's DC Comics, and we'll see what else Marvel has going on. <clears throat> and um, and so, I, you know, I learned about the Fantastic Four, and I learned about Doctor Strange, and I learned about Thor, and... And I remember seeing I remember seeing an issue of of uh, I remember well I got a little life lesson from an issue of Thor when um, it was this wonderful story uh, where you know back in the day Odin was always putting his disobedient son Thor through some kind of some kind of trouble yeah. for disobedience or arrogance or pride or something like that he was always he was always punishing him in some way. And and I forget the actual content of the story. I just remember that at the end of it, uh, poor Thor has had the stuffing kicked out of him, and he's unconscious in a pile of rubble. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and Odin appears, uh, a, and in a, in a you know beautiful rim lighting shot uh, of of Kirby's majesty, and he and he picks up his son Thor and cradles him Pieta like mm-hmm. and walks back into the light toward toward Asgard and and it uh, and so what st- stuck with me was this Pieta like silhouette image of Odin um, edge lit cradling his you know gigantic son in his <laughs> arms 
yeah. uh, uh, and feeling remorseful, you know, about about uh, being so strict with him. Mm. And and it was such a powerful, moving uh, image that I remembered it as a splash page. Mm-hmm. You know, because years later, when I was I was a fan of Kirby and 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 I and I was you know imitating Kirby all the time, and and uh, as I learned to draw, uh, I, this image I I just thought it was a I just thought it was a uh, a splash page, one of those quintessential Kirby splash images. Mm-hmm. And uh, the first the first time we ever went over to dinner at Walter and Wheezy's apartment in New York back when I first got into comics in the 80s. Mm-hmm. I related this story to Walter. And I don't know if your listeners know Walter and Louise Simonson, but they're oh, very wonderful people. They're legends. If they don't know them, they're, I don't know what, why they're listening to a comics podcast. Because, there you go. <laughs> you know, uh, but but um, uh, Walter and Wheezy invited Judy and me and our infant son, Kal-El, over to their uh, apartment for uh, lentil soup. And I, I related the story to this author and I were talking about our influences, and we're both huge Curry fans. I yeah. told him about this, this fantastic splash panel from Thor, and Walter's mustache turns up into the, a smile. Because you never see Walter's mouth. You just see that, that, that enormous mustache. Right. It's, 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 as ex, it's as expressive as if you were an animated character. You know, so the, the mustache turns up into a smile. And he has a mischievous look in his eye, and he goes back into his comic book room, and he knows right where it is. Wow. Among the thousands of comic books that Walter Simonson owns, he knows right where it is. Broop, pulls out a thin comic book off the shelf, flips to the last page, and it's an eight-panel page. Hmm. And, it's a, and the image I'm talking about is a single eighth of a page panel. Mm-hmm. So... Um, that was a pretty big. That was a pretty big lesson on on uh, the size of the image isn't isn't necessarily as important as as the image itself. But I was, you know, uh, the Marvel comics. Uh, I of course learned who Jack Kirby was, mm-hmm. and then when Jack left, uh, left. By the time Jack left Marvel. It was what, 1970? It was 1970. Like yes, yeah, 70. 1970, okay. Mm-hmm. 1970. I thought, oh, it's the end of Marvel. Marvel is doomed. <laughs> but I heard he was coming over to DC. Yeah. And I heard that he was going to take over one of the Superman books. And I totally lost my blob. I was so <laughs> excited. And I, and I got so wrapped up in the whole New Gods and Mr. Miracle. Oh, yeah. I, I absolutely I loved Mr. Miracle. Yes. You know, the love story between him and Barda. It was mm-hmm. sort of also a sitcom. Mm-hmm. It, it captured some of that, some of that family sitcom, uh, uh, gentle fun vibe that that Fantastic Four had. Yeah. Um, uh, so I really loved um, uh, Mr. Miracle. I mean, I loved the big cosmic stuff too, but I really liked the quiet human stuff in Mr. Mm-hmm. Miracle a great deal. You know, and, and, and of course, and of course, another one thing was Jimmy Olsen, which mm-hmm. even though they were redrawing Je- uh, Superman's face, all of all of Jack's faces. They were redrawing in, in the office. Yeah, you couldn't miss the storytelling. It was just so powerful, and I, it was actually during I'm coming to the actual point of the story. Um, <laughs> it was actually during that uh, experience when Jack was, you know, he was drawing a complete. He was writing and drawing a complete comic book every single week. Yeah, and sometimes more. You know, one week. Jay Wilson would come out the next week. Forever People would come out the next week. Miss Miracle would come out the next week. Uh, uh, um, uh, New Gods would come out. Bam, 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 bam. So much production in such a short amount of time mm-hmm. is absolutely mind-boggling, particularly because I know what actually goes into a comic book now. But, yeah. you know, at, uh, however old I was, 12 or 13, it was not enough for me. Um, and and that's when I really got serious about drawing my own comic books because I couldn't wait for Jack. <laughs> you know, drawing and writing and drawing twenty-two pages in a month was just in a week was just not fast enough for me. So, I started, so that's when I started writing and drawing, and I got really serious about it. Oh, that's awesome. Well, let, let, let me pause you right there, John, because sure. you, you hit on quite a few things that I'm in total agreement with. Uh, number one, the Fourth World Saga, Commandy, that whole period of Kirby 
in the early 70s right there that is my favorite kirby i have a whole long box devoted to that stuff you know so you so um, you're speaking my language right there and right and number two um you know it's interesting that you mentioned kirby because i was going to ask about your influences and one of the things once i started reading your stuff like when i first came into the hobby in 93 and saw your work you know, I didn't know who Kirby was. I didn't know, you know, a lot of the um, other artists, you know what I'm saying, until uh, maybe like a year or so later after I started really digging in. But that's the thing that struck me about your work was just the uh, the dynamism and the way that you were drawing at that time with these big, chunky figures that really kind of had authority, you know. So once I learned who Kirby was and I started seeing some of his work, it was like, ah, I wonder, I wonder if this guy likes Kirby. You know, because it just seemed so it seemed to have that 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 energy and that authority that Kirby put into his figures. Like, you know, when you were drawing, you know, Superman, you know, and he would fall into, you know, a wall or something. It felt like he fell into a wall just with the heft of the figure and everything. So, you know, that that makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. Well, I think, you know, I think Jack really um, uh and he's not my only influence, but I think uh, he's probably my earliest and strongest influence. Um, and that uh, he really, I think to this day, and what I still get from Kirby, mm -hmm. is that he invented the visual language of superheroes. Oh, all of it. Yes, the whole lexicon. You know, yeah. uh, the, the, in other words, no one before him really um, captured the kinesthetic quality of superheroes uh, uh, anything like that. If you look at, I mean, and I and don't get me wrong, I, I, I love uh, Golden Age comics, um, and probably the most dynamic of them was Joe Schuster at the time, mm. because he would he would put Superman in all kinds of different poses. But it was all pretty much, um, you know, uh, uh, side scrolling imagery. You know what I'm saying? It was mm -hmm. it was it was a lot of medium shots, uh, and and very little breaking of the fourth wall. Yeah. Just figure, it was figures jumping this way to that way. Um, and and it, that's mostly because comics, I think, were imitating movies, which at the time did not play a lot with, with uh, the X... The, was it the X-axis? Yes, yeah, like... X, well, no, the Z-axis. De depth of space, they yeah. Lot, they didn't play a lot with the Z-axis in movies. They mostly... Uh, it was mostly a, a, a two-dimensional... Mm -hmm. uh, form of form of, of artwork, and also figures were posed realistically because the early the early comic book artists were, were either they went to art school where they took life drawing classes, or they were tremendously influenced by by the the stellar realists of the time, uh, uh, Alex Raymond and yeah, yeah. Um, Hal Foster, mm -hmm. uh, and those guys were the, the defining influences. But you know, the guys imitating them in the comics didn't draw really as well, most of them, as <laughs> Alex Raymond or Hal Foster. Uh, but they they but they were essentially following that tradition. Mm -hmm. And Jack, somewhere along the way, um, invented uh, a new way to do superheroes that was, uh, and it, it developed slowly, but, um, but it, he started to do things that are intrinsically comic book. Mm -hmm. They are they are intrinsic to the visual storytelling medium of comics, and that had to do with the deep perspective and the sense of weight and the sense of motion, and the uh, the, uh, the quality and gesture of superhero action that suddenly made superheroes dynamic and fun because uh, you know the characters don't actually move. You imagine the the movement, right? It's like Scott McCloud says, comic books really happen in the borders between panels. Mm -hmm. And and a comic book artist, and Jack really discovered this, a comic book artist is just triggering the reader's imagination so that the reader feels that figure impacting with the wall in, uh, with the right amount of weight. Or the figure really feels that they're bouncing across a, uh, a rooftop water tower. Um, uh, and the motion is, is triggered in the reader's imagination uh, by how you spin that artwork. And Jack really, he invented a lot of the stuff that even artists today who've never even heard of Kirby uh, uh, do without without realizing where that stuff started to come from. Mm. So, uh, so, read, uh, listeners, 
out there, if you don't know who Jack Kirby is, it's time to get on that. Oh, past time. Past due. (laughs) (laughs) But let me ask you this while we're talking about influences right quick. Um, Who are some of your other influences then, John? Oh, my gosh. Um, I have, God, I have an awful lot. Hmm. Uh, I have a list of about 20 prime comic book influences and and, and 20 prime illustrator influences. Um, uh, And, uh, you know, I draw on those influences uh, depending on what kind of work I'm doing. So, yeah. so uh, if I, you know, if I'm doing superhero comics, I might pull from Jack and, and Joe Kane and, mm. and uh, uh, Walter Simonson. Um, yeah. If I'm, you know, if I'm doing more realism-based stuff, I might pull from uh, uh, Joe Kubert or Alex Toth or, mm. or Alex Raymond. Uh, so, I mean, it's it's hard to, and this is this is a question. Obviously, I get asked often. Everybody gets that. Get asked get that sure. often. But it's it's really hard. Uh, you know, when you're an artist, or when you're a fan, it doesn't matter. Everything is grist for the mill. Everything 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 you see informs your imagination and 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 your memory in some level. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, Almost every artist I, I see is, uh, is an influence. Mm. Um, uh, and, you know, I, for about 15 years after I, after I left the Superman book, um, I did a lot, I spent a lot of time doing um, licensing artwork for DC licensing, which later became Warner Home, DC Home Products. Right. And, and uh, I started doing that kind of work because um, I have the ability to be a style chameleon. If I, if there, are, there are a lot of artists whose work I can imitate pretty flawlessly mm-hmm. with a little bit of study. Uh, and so I was doing a lot of drawing like dead guys. Uh, <laughs> and, and, then, and then later on, trying to draw like uh, Garcia Lopez, which is yeah. more, more of a stretch, because he's really good. Yes. Um, uh, <laughs> but... Um, but I, I did a lot of that stuff, and I think the reason I was able to do that um, is because, uh, I, you know, I stand on the shoulders of real giants. I stand on the shoulders of the great uh, innovators of this art form. Mm. Um, and and they're, they're just, I wish I could give you a better answer, but they're just too numerous to, to na- name, really. Oh, no, no. And, 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 you know, coincidentally, John, one of the first um, comics that I got of yours, um, I can actually recall it from the store, was, um, I believe it may have been during Zero Hour. There was an issue where Man of Steel, where um, he was um, facing off against, like, these different versions of Batman. And I remember having to look back at the credits and, like, um, did did more people than just this one guy draw this? Because I mean, you got because <laughs> you had the Bob Kane version, you had the uh, Dick Sprang version, you had yeah. the Neil Adams, and then the Frank Miller version, and, and you nailed them. I was like, yeah, thank wow. you. that was uh, you know that was a that was a that was a pivotal and fateful issue because um, you know that you know those. Most of those were not swipes. Most of those was me blowing my deadline by by uh, studying uh, a particular artist until I could actually draw like them. Wow! Uh, and I did that for every single uh, artist, and it was an enormous it was an enormous artistic feat. But that's when I discovered I had this this uh, chameleon ability, and it's also when DC licensing discovered I had this chameleon mm. ability. So it sort of uh, it sort of led into um, all of that, and and uh, you know it was I mean we're just Weezy had written this story where Batman from different universes all mm-hmm. converged because that was what was happening in the big event. Right. Um, uh, what was it? Countdown. As a zero was zero called? hour. Zero hour. That's yes. the one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, it was for for zero hour. So um, and I don't. It, it, it must have been a moment of insanity where I said, oh, I know. I'll depict all these different Batmans from different universes in the style of, of, of 
and put in Batman artist. Yes. I mean, <laughs> What could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it, you know it definitely worked, and that I know that made an impression on me too. Just like oh, he, he nailed all of these. Like these actually look like the people, the artists that actually drew them, and you know that drew me even further into tracking down more of your stuff. And even over the whole course of uh, Man of Steel, you know it's interesting to see how you know um, your style would change, like you're intimating. Like it started out with this very powerful kirby simon-esque you know angular just oh i love it those first 12 issues john are just so powerful and then you get deep into deeper into the run and you know and and the anchor um dennis junkie is right there with you just yeah yeah, just right there with you and it's just seamless month in a month out you know so i i can definitely attest to that you know you being a chameleon and actually having it work wonderfully well well thank you i i'm you know a lot of a lot of credit goes to the uh, phenomenal patience of Mike Carlin at the time because um, it was, you know, it was a sort of a foolhardy exercise in that in order to make your deadlines, you really, you know, you got to do four or five pages a week. Mm-hmm. You just have to do that. Um, and and uh, uh, I blew it badly that month because I was, you know, I was doing maybe two pages a week oh. because I'd spend two two days, uh, you know, um, in doing crash emergence, emergent, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, immersion yeah. crash course in the style of a particular artist. Um, and then to draw like the next artist, I then have to sort of unlearn the first one and immerse myself in the next one. So it was, it was, I don't know how late I was on that uh, issue, but I know I was late. Oh, but it paid off. <laughs> but let me ask you this, John. Uh, going back to that time, you know, where you <clears throat> got on to Man of Steel. Um, this is about 1991, I believe, correct? Yeah. All right. So around that time, you know, you have a couple of things um, going on in the industry. Uh, foremost, and this is a question I've always wondered. Um, about two years ago or so, I spoke to uh, Norm Brayfogle, obviously the uh, famous uh, Batman artist. Sure. and the question I asked him was, um, DC had given him his own book per se, you know, Shadow of the Bat, you know, and that was just like, you know, when Marvel was giving, you know, a few of their stars who later left, of course, their own books, you know, Todd McFarlane, a new number one Spider-Man, Jim Lee, a new number one X-Men and so forth. And I wonder if Man of Steel was maybe an effort to not only expand that Superman family of books at the time, but if that was a correlation to, you know, that, that particular, uh, I guess, phenomenon going on, you know, starting these new number ones with the artists who were associated with those characters. Well, I don't know how much of that was, you know, coincidence and luck or how much of it, uh, um, of it was uh, a specific uh, policy decision. But um, my, when, when Mike Carlin left Fantastic Four to go and edit John Byrne on on Man of Steel. Mm-hmm. Take over the Superman books. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he um, immediately invited me to, to come over to Superman. He he knew I loved Superman. He you know he was real friendly with our with our son Kal El. Yeah. Uh, uh, and um, you know and he thought that I would be actually really good on the Superman books. And I was. I'm embarrassed to say it, but I was um, scared. Superman meant so much to me. Yeah. I didn't want to go until I felt like it was really at the peak of my powers. Huh. Okay. It was ridiculous. It was ridiculous, but I sort of, I put it off at least for a year or so. Really? Um, uh, uh, but during that time, Mike would sort of, these boxes would arrive at the house every couple of weeks with Superman swag in it, addressed to Kal-El. Uh. Action figures and books and stuff like that. Just, you know, the kind of stuff that, that, that comes in comp boxes at DC. And they have a lot. This, this stuff would show up at Kal-El, and, and Kal-El would wander into the studio. Seven-year-old kal would wander into the studio. <laughs> and he'd sort of lean on my desk, look over my shoulder, and say, you know, uh, we should really go to work for Mike Carlin. <laughs> 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 um, uh, but what really what really tipped it over is Mike uh, contacted Louise and I one day and said, um, "Look, you guys will 
Come and do Superman together as a team. Mm-hmm. Uh, DC will give you your own Superman book. We'll, we'll start a new Superman title just for you guys. Wow. Okay. And, and, uh, uh, and you know, that probably had a whole lot more to do with Weezy's credibility than mine. But mm-hmm. in any case, um, uh, that is not a, that is not an offer you can, you can refuse. Oh, no. So, so, uh, so off we went to do issue number one of Man of Steel. Uh, and, and, you know, going back, uh, like I mentioned, um, once I discovered your work and I went back and tracked down like those first uh, few issues of Man of Steel, you know, the thing that's so startling about it and the way that you sustain it is just at the outset, it, it just felt like you, you had arrived. Like, I didn't know that you had books before before that, like you had been in the industry before that, you know what I'm saying? And it was just like, oh, this, this stuff, this stuff is incredible. It's wonderful. And, you know, you were mentioning about being at the peak of your powers, and it definitely felt that way. I mean, even when I look at them now, it's like, holy jeez, this is, this is, this stuff is just so incredible, you know, and so um, sure-handed as well, you know? Well, I, I think I got better once I got on Superman. Mm. I think I got better. Um, and, you know, of course, I'm hypercritical. I look back at some of that stuff now, and I, and I think, like, you know, I'll go, holy mackerel, that head is too small. Or, <laughs> what was I thinking with that chin? You know? <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, I, so I think, at least I hope I've gotten better in the intervening years. But, uh, but that, that, that business about, you know, not wanting to get on Superman yet because I wasn't at the peak of my powers was really just stupid BS. It was cold feet. Uh, because I think um, getting on Superman uh, uh, improved me. It, it actually uh, electri- electrified me in a positive direction. Oh, absolutely, and, and it's tangible. All right, so let me ask you this. Let's jump forward a couple of years um, after you know, Man of Steel starts to uh, 1993, um, and this is the era of the um, big event, the death and the return. And we all knew he was going to return, but the death and sure. return of Superman. And, you know, that, that whole era, I know people kind of look at, look at it subjectively in terms of, oh, you know, it's this, you know, market glut of books and, you know, excess and everything like that. But it seemed like with that particular run of books, even reading them, reading them um, now, looking back, you know, it, it was a, it was a quality story for the most part to me. And, one of the things that came out of that, you know, that, you know, kind of is a, a bigger realm, so to speak, was the uh, creation of the uh, character, John Henry Irons, also known as Steel. And that was a creation of both yourself and Louise Simonson. Yeah. Um, now, what what went into that? And also, do you still, I guess, receive um, credits and royalties from the character? Especially having been adapted into a rather odious movie by one Shaquille <laughs> O'Neal. <laughs> uh, oh well, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, poor Shaq. Honestly, he, he 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 was so earnest in that movie. He yeah, loved the character. He loved the character. Mm-hmm. And after the success of, of of what's the genie movie he was in? Oh, K- Kazam. Kazam. Kazam made money, right? So they were like, I, I'm sure it went like this. It was like, so oh, Shaq, uh, let's make another one of them movies. Like, uh, <laughs> what do you want to do? And he's like, well, I want to do this guy, you know? Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, and so I really think um, I really think the movie wouldn't have gotten made without Shaq. But I, I don't mm-hmm. I'm, I don't know how much everybody else was on board. Um, and and the best thing the best thing that you can say about the movie perhaps is that it it sort of you know. It's certainly one of the con- top contenders for worst superhero film adaptation of all time, <laughs> uh, and and it's and it's and it's too bad, but the, that's you know that, that's a distinction. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, that, even so, I'm grateful. I still occasionally will get twenty cents or something like that from oh. from uh, the Steel movie, so I don't want to slag it too much because. Um, you know, uh, if you look back at it, Annabeth Gish is in there, and yeah. she's a really good actress. And um, uh, uh, I, I think know. Richard Roundtree is in it. And yeah, man, Richard Roundtree is yeah. in it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, so we had Shaq and Shaft. I mean, you can't. I mean, that's true. 
It should have been great. It should have been great. It should have been great. You know, and, and you can see that, that Jack, not a great actor, is, is, is putting his heart into it. Yeah. You know, um, uh, and, uh, but, I mean, it, it, it felt like 1970s television to me. Mm-hmm. You know, and just in terms of threat, uh, I mean, and I love Judd Nelson. He's a fellow Mainer, you know, like me. <laughs> um, but, but, uh, but, you know, uh, Shaquille O'Neal in armor versus versus uh, the guy from The Breakfast Club. It's a really <laughs> short book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, well, let me ask you in terms of the um, the actual creation of the character within the comics. Um, I, I guess once um, editorial kind of came up with the storyline, which I'm sure you guys were in on, obviously. Um, yeah. What 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 dictated that you know one it would be John Henry Irons because that that is so on the nose in terms of obviously having the hammer and that whole iron you know motif so yes. to speak yeah so what what kind of went into the creation of the character well uh, first of all everything I'm telling you is just my recollection of it so mm. it's 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 uh, that's a caveat I I could be wrong and 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 hopefully if I am Weezy or Mike or somebody can correct me but. Um, we were, we didn't want to bring Superman back right away. Well, first of all, let me preface this by saying, for the readers who don't know, in those days, the Superman books were all done like Marvel books, uh, in that um, the writers wrote plot first, uh, and the most of the artists drew the story from the plot, and then the writer would come in and, and add dialogue based on the artwork, but more than that, more than that level, beyond that level of collaboration, uh, uh, a couple of times a year, DC would fly all of us, and I don't mean just the writers from all four books, but the pencilers from all four books, and the inkers from all four books, and wow. even Glenn Whitmore, the colorist, and fly us all together some location, usually DC, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, put us up for four or five days while we... Um, basically broke the arcs for the next year and figured out what was going to happen in all four books. And we, so we wrote it together. I mean, this is why, you know, in Batman versus Superman, all of us get a little credit for, for Doomsday. Oh, cool. Because, because uh, all of that stuff was sort of written in a, in a writer's room the way they write television. Right. Um, and everybody had, had uh, a piece of it. But, you know... When we killed Superman, we wanted it to be, we wanted it to be meaningful, and 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 DC, uh, bless their hearts, actually went along with some of Mike's uh, 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 desires, requests, mm-hmm. like to actually stop publication for a couple of months, um, which is a pretty unusual thing for a for a publisher to be willing to do. Yeah, but they stopped publication for a couple of months, um, and then. For uh, several months, we had Superman books published, but with no Superman in them. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and this was a courageous thing, I think, for DC to do. But um, we were left at our meeting uh, of what to do during that period. And um, somebody, maybe Roger Stern, suggested, or, or might have been Mike, suggested the substitute Superman. Hmm. Okay. You know. Uh, and and it's sort of a riff on on something that DC did in the '60s, I guess, the League of Substitute Superman. But mm-hmm. but uh, these would be you know people that would uh, appear uh, to sort of fill Superman's shoes, and there would be initially some sort of question as to is he back? Is he one of these guys? Did he come back to life and is he a cyborg now? Did he come back to life and he is he a black guy now? Mm-hmm. You know, um, uh, what's the story around that uh, <coughs> stuff? And and it was decided that um, maybe it was Mike who decided this that that uh, each of the teams would uh, be able to sort of do their own thing with their own character for a while. Huh, okay. Uh, and we would each come up with something, and um, you know. Uh, Carl Kiesel had a great idea to do a very 90s Superboy. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, uh, Roger Stern 
came up with the eradicator and yes. uh, the uh, you know, the eradicator. Yes, it was. Uh, and mm-hmm. then and then uh, you know Dan Dan, whose genius certainly at that time was coming up with better villains for Superman. That was that was it was sort of all of our quest, but but really uh, one of Dan's great contributions was a sort of an ongoing quest to create villains that Superman could punch. Mm-hmm. You know, to move away from business suit villains and things like that. <laughs> yeah. Things you could actually hit, which was really speaking right to my seven-year-old self, who was disappointed in those uh, 1960s comics and wanted Superman to hit things. Right. <laughs> you know, and break down walls. So, um, so uh, obviously, obviously, Dan felt the same way. So he came up with the cyborg Superman. Yes. And he said to Weezy and I, well, why don't you guys do just some sort of schlub, some sort of working working class schlub? Uh, and I think he was suggesting that maybe, um, uh, you know, we do the comedy uh, of uh, Superman, which actually um, might have been good, you know, for us to do a comedy Superman. But Weezy and I started talking about it, and I had, I don't know, in high school, uh, uh, drawn these these drawings of John Henry, uh, hmm. because I had been, um, I'd been influenced years earlier by the George Powell, uh, 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 and, and puppetoon story, uh, cartoon of John Henry, the real, you know, the real John Henry. Right. And, and, um, Ezra, uh, what's the artist's name, who did a wonderful, wonderful illustrated children's book of John Henry. Ezra... Uh, it'll come to me later, and I'll shout it out in the middle of something else. Anyway, <laughs> um, uh, I loved the character. I loved the the archetype. Of the, uh, the, he had this, you know, he was all about heart, right? Um, mm-hmm. uh, and that's sort of that's sort of me. I'm all about heart, uh, and so that character really rang with me. And and also, I had been thinking that, um, you know. Uh, DC did not really have a satisfactory Iron Man at the time, hmm. uh, and DC had nothing like Thor. Hmm. So I thought, well, you know, we could have a hammer and a cape like Thor. We could have armor like uh, Iron Man. Mm-hmm. But he could also, but he really should be based on John Henry, who wielded a hammer. Right. And then Weezy said, you know, there was a real John Henry. It wasn't just a story. And she told me. Uh, um, the, the actual backstory of the historical figure John Henry, mm-hmm. uh, and that that really that really pinched it for me. Um, and uh, she started coming up with story bits, which were all wonderful. Yes, and uh, I you know I quickly came up with the with with the basic idea of armor cape and and uh, and hammer. Um, and I wanted it to be a long-handled sledgehammer, like you would drive spikes with uh, on a railroad, obviously. Yeah. Um, uh, and I also wanted it to be sort of home, sort of a homemade guy, um, because I just, you know, basically I wanted to draw that image of John Henry working the forge. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and it just it just grew from that and. There, there comes a time, sometimes, if you're lucky, there comes a time in the creation of a character where you're not really creating the character. The character is just coming through you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever um, drawn in, you know, invented characters yourself. But, oh, sure. But sometimes when it really works, that's what happens. It's like John Henry is floating around up there in the ether, mm-hmm. and uh, he wanted to come down, and uh, uh, the angel selected Weezy and me, and uh, and um, and he, he bam he came he came through, um, and to this day, man, I I love John Henry. I would yeah, me be, too. You know, I, he's actually a character I'd like to do more of, and I'm delighted that post convergence he's back and himself. Hmm. You know, he's not some sort of weird New Fifty Two redesign. He's still <laughs> basically he's still basically John Henry, um, and uh, uh, I think there's. I mean, I'm not sure how it works with the, because John Henry's origin was so linked with 
uh, the death of Superman. Yeah. Um, in that John Henry is a guy who he was saved by Superman. At a low point in his life, he was saved by Superman, and and he w- he wasn't just physically saved. Just sort of his spirit was sort of was sort of saved. Mm-hmm. Was sort of revived by Superman, which is really sort of what Superman you know did for me as a kid. He sort of hmm. sort of uh, kept my spirit uh, alive. Um, and uh, and um, I think that's an essential part of the character. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how they're swinging that with the current uh, incarnation of the character, but I'm really glad the character is still around. I'm really glad to get a tiny little royalty check every now and then uh, yeah. for him. Uh, and I like the possibility that, uh, you know, the, the possibility is still open that I could draw another John Henry story at some point because he really is, you know, he's great fun to draw. He's a, he's, he's, uh, he's a lovable person. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and he's just, he's just so, he's just so cool. Yeah. And I always complain to his face and, and, and as an archetype and as an individual character, he's just, he's very gratifying to draw, uh, as is his whole family. Although some of my favorites have gotten killed. And there you go. <laughs> you know, and, and that's the thing too, John. Like I was, I was just reading like that that um, series of issues, just the um, uh, death of Superman issues for Man is still. Um, I guess about a week ago because I was planning on speaking with you, and um, you know that that stuff still holds up, and everything that you're mentioning in terms of like the planes of his face and all, it seemed like even. The, the the way that you were drawing the other characters in that time too got you know really sharp and angular you know and it was just like just powerful stuff like powerful stuff like when well around that time um, and, and I, honestly I think I can I think I can trace this back to to when I was doodling the character at the meeting but around that time I started to be really influenced by uh, uh, Sergio Topi, oh, yes. who was an influence on Walter at the time, a, yeah. uh, a Spanish artist, and Dennis Cowan, mm, who, mm-hmm. who was also doing some very Topi inspired work. Yes. So, so that kind of uh, sharp pen work, where the uh, a little bit like uh, J.C. Leyendecker too, mm-hmm. where the pen strokes sort of delineate the direction of the plane or fact of the surface you're rendering. Yes. Um, and and that really, for some reason, that really caught fire with me and it seemed like a good way to, to render shiny metal, mm-hmm. you know? Yes. Uh, uh, and I look back on that stuff now, and I still like it. It feels very, very middle 90s to me. But I, <laughs> but I, but I still, uh, I, I really uh, like the, you know, the way it defines the facets and planes and edges of someone's face or physique or or whatever. So, uh, and you know, like with any stylistic stylistic indulgence, sometimes I went too far. Imagine <laughs> that. But uh, but yeah, I do kind of think that that uh, that style holds up. I wonder if I could. I don't know if I could still do it or not. But uh, uh, mm-hmm. but yeah, it did it did kind of hold up, and it sort of gave the John Henry issues um, uh, a flavor of their own. I thought. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that that stuff is still. Fantastic to me. I love that stuff. All right. Well, well. Let, let's let's um take it away from comics for a little bit. And um, sure. I wanted to mention, or at least um, ask, in in terms of, uh, there was an interview that I saw that I read and came across, uh, that mentioned that you were actually um that you're actually a school teacher, uh, for a, for a time, a middle school teacher, I think. Oh, uh, well, not technically. No. When I when um. Probably at the time of that interview, I was still living in Maine. That's it, yes. We, 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 yeah, we moved from Maine probably seven years ago now. Okay. Um, uh, but when I lived in Maine, for many years, I did an after-school program uh, in the uh, Rockland District um, Middle School and in the high school. I did a program for high schoolers and middle schoolers, uh, an after-school comics drawing program. Oh, cool. Um, uh, for... Uh, a crop of amazing kids, some of whom I'm still in touch with. Awesome. Uh, and at least one of which has become uh, a professional animator. Hmm. So uh, I, I like to selfishly and self-aggrandizingly think that I played a <laughs> role in that. 
You did. Um, <laughs> well, well, I'll, t- I'll take credit for it anyway. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, so um, uh, I did that. And, and years before, I was uh, uh, sort of the unofficial assistant teacher in a little one-room schoolhouse out on Monsigan Island in Maine. Oh, cool. So um, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not really a teacher, I and, and I don't want to take credit for being a teacher because – I know real teachers, <laughs> mm-hmm. and I know what real teachers have to do. My wife was a uh, New York City public school teacher for oh. most of her career. Wow. Um, uh, PS 166, represent. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, and a lot of, uh, several of my friends, uh, closest friends are teachers. So, so I don't want to say that I was a teacher, but I did some teaching, and I uh, love teaching very much. I really liked working with kids. You know, and, and just, just from – not just the interviews, but in speaking with you, you, you do have a sense of, you, you do seem like you have a very giving spirit, John, in terms of, you know, that, that heart that you mentioned a few moments ago, like how, you know, you were mentioning Superman has a lot of that heart and that you yourself have, have a lot of heart. And, you know, that seems to come across, especially when you're seeking to, you know, give of yourself to others, you know, in that way. Because, you know, education is a, a very, a very, a very tough, tough road to go about, especially, you know, um, with, with students who may not be as receptive. But if you can reach those you can reach, you know, you make a world of difference, definitely. Well, I really feel like, I mean, you know, where, where we lived in Maine was a, a poor rural area. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and like a lot of places that are uh, economically really challenged. Yeah. Um, uh Expectations are are kept low for kids, mm-hmm. um, and and you know um, particularly there's a thing about us Mainers where it's like uh, you know life is hard. Don't get any expectations above your station. You know life is hard. You work hard, then you die. You better get the, the younger you get used to that, the better. And mm. and um, and I'm getting in trouble with everybody in Maine right now. <laughs> uh, but uh, it can be tough growing up in Maine. I mean, mm-hmm. yes, it's beautiful, like they like there's the ocean, there's the woods, there's blah 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 blah, places to run around. Yes, there's a lot of wonderful stuff about Maine, but there's also a lot that's that's really uh, rugged. It's mm. really hard. Um, and uh, you know, um, I, I hope that I hope that. Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of arts either. A lot of the arts, as we know, for the last 30 years or so, the yeah. arts programs in this country have been attacked. Uh, and I think there's something a kid could get from from uh, the arts programs in school that they don't get from the academic stuff mm-hmm. uh, um, in terms of uh, thinking in terms of possibilities. Mm, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I mean, um, one in a thousand high school theater kids may go on to actually be, become a professional professional in that field. Yeah. But everybody who's had that play experience um, has had the experience of something uh, bigger than the everyday material. You know, go to work, go home eat a pot pie, go to bed, get up, go to work. Right. You know, they're, they're, um, and, uh, and I've, this is not, I mean, this is something maybe I hope I've had a hand in, in facilitating, but the joy of being a teacher uh, of an arts program in particular mm-hmm. um, is when you see wonderful kids realize how, absolutely wonderful they actually are Mm, mm -hmm. you know they come in and they're wonderful but they often don't know it usually middle school man do you remember how hard middle school was oh don't remind me oh geez you know (laughs) i mean it's like you go into middle school and you're coming from you're still a kid you know in sixth grade you're still a child but seventh and eighth graders are all puked out teenagers yeah and and you're about to go through that 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 terrifying transformation and it's madness it's mm-hmm. so hard. Being a middle schooler is so hard. And um, and a lot of kids, uh, their spirits are crushed in middle school, and they never really recover. Mm. You know, and they, they go on to have 
uh, really rocky adolescence and sometimes get into worse trouble than that. And, and middle school is this is that's really where the action is. Uh, I really salute middle school teachers who, who take that seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, the, the joy, uh, and I was lucky to experience some of this, is um, when when you see when you see a kid realize that they can do something that they thought nobody from Maine actually does, you know, and, and they and, and they have access to a, a skill that they thought was was um, uh, completely mysterious previously, and and suddenly begin to get an inkling of of uh, how wonderful they are, and hopefully from that, you know, they'll go on to think about greater possibilities for their own life. But just that moment that that lucky teachers get. Of seeing a kid realize their that they have potential, yeah. not necessarily even realize what that potential is, but suddenly realize that they have potential and that there's hope. You know, the mm-hmm. idea of being able to give a kid some measure of hope. Um, uh, uh, you know, I would have appreciated that at that age. You know? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so yeah. So teaching was um, uh, teaching was really a gratifying, wonderful experience. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, it, it definitely sounds like it, John. That's my hats off to you for that, you know, for that outreach and that inspiration. I'm sure you've given to all of your students, you know. Well, I mean, I, I you know, I don't know. I don't know if I'm doing them a favor by encouraging them to draw comics <laughs> for a living. But, but, uh, uh, um, but ho- you know, um, hopefully they had a good time and hopefully they uh, continue to benefit a little bit from, from their good time. Oh, definitely. Definitely. All right. Well, well, last question for you, John, um, and coming up, I guess, closer to present, present day. Um, I saw that you had your own creator owned, um, comic, uh, strong man. Um, you and your son, Kalel collaborated on it and, um, I've been trying to get a copy of it and I was, let me give you a on, on, on strong man. Um, Okay. Two years ago, two years ago, we we started a Kickstarter campaign uh-huh. to try and fund uh, the production of the, of Strongman. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, what we were actually going for was, I since learned, too ambitious for for, for Kickstarter. Um, really, I was looking for a way to pay my bills while I drew the book. Mm-hmm. In other words, to get paid the equivalent of a page rate mm-hmm. um, uh, while I drew the book. Uh, and we didn't make our funding goal, which because it's Kickstarter, everyone got there, every, no one got charged uh, in the end. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, because if you don't reach the minimum that you require, nobody gets charged. Right. Um, and, uh, and so unfortunately, uh, Strongman has gone back into the file of, of Sunday. And oh. every year, every year I take a few days and, and, and when I don't have anything else to do and, and work a little bit on Strongman. And, and hopefully someday I'll be able to just bomb through and do a whole issue. Um, but, uh, but it's back to being a hobby, unfortunately. Oh. It's not out there. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I, I, cause that, that's the thing that um, had me scratching my head. It's like I, I, I didn't hear about it until maybe – a year ago. Yeah, it feels like it ought to be out there, right? Because it got all this publicity on 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 uh, on Kickstarter for a while, and and for a while it looked like we were going to make the goal, and it felt it felt real. Uh, and now that it's back to being a hobby, uh, um, you're not the first person to say, "What happened with Strongman? Where's Strongman?" We yeah. didn't get the money. We just didn't get the money. Oh, okay, okay. And, and for those who aren't familiar. Uh, with what the concept of strong man was, uh, why don't you break it down for him here, if possible? Okay. Well, uh, I mean, I hate to publish something that uh, publicize something that oh well, you know what it actually if... happened yet, but but the but you know just to keep it alive. Okay. Uh, strong man is literally a circus strong man in the early part of the 20th century. Okay. Um, uh, he's. Uh, um, uh, a, a Russian orphan uh, whose village was burned up by Cossacks uh, back uh, before the revolution uh, there, and he um, escaped the, the destruction of his home village through the woods, and um, starving and dying, he happened to come across uh, uh, 
uh, a hermit strong man who, who taught him the way. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's more involved than that. But uh, the way it plays out is he's sort of a proto superhero uh-huh. in an era before Superman. So, so his adventures happen primarily before 1938, more in the more in the era of of the Shadow and Doctor Str- Doctor uh, uh, Doc Savage yeah. than than Superman. Uh, and he uh, and his and his band of, of circus performers, fellow circus performers, mm-hmm. each of whom have their own sort of superpower. Um, it's there's Little Girl and there's uh, Bella the Ball, who's a giant fat lady, who's sort of his sparring partner, and there's uh, um, uh, a, a knife throwing midget, and there is uh, maybe my favorite of all. Um, we, we've written and haven't drawn a time traveling adventure wherein uh, um, uh, he finds himself in the Ice Age and he brings back with him a baby mammoth who grows up to be um, to be Wolcott and he grows up to be the most awesome circus elephant of all time. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, but uh, together they fight pulpy type threats uh, ranging from. Um, from Roaring Twenties crime uh, mm-hmm. to uh, to sort of um, uh, Lovecraftian magic, hmm. and and the and he's he's sort of Superman like, uh, except he's the reverse. He has he has special strength against magic. Ah, yeah. In other words, you can kill him with a bullet, but uh, because he's just a really strong man. But he is, for some reason, uh, as yet to be revealed, cool. he is highly resistant, almost invulnerable to magic. So if there's a multi-tentacled nether god that needs to be wrestled back into the mud, he's your man. <laughs> <laughs> man, that, that, that sounds so cool, John. And, you know, it seemed like, for some reason, maybe about maybe three or four years ago, there was a slight resurgence, it seemed, in, like, you know, pulpy material. And I may be thinking of the initiative that um, DC did, something called like First Wave or something, where they had bought like the rights to Doc Savage, um, the Spirit, and a couple other of those uh, pulp tradition yeah, characters. They bought the Seaton Smith characters. Yeah. Yes, that's what it was. Yes. Yeah. And so it seemed like for a second, even outside of that, people were kind of receptive to it, as well as you know, I know that um, Dynamite Publishing also, you know, does, you know. Uh, uh, re- yes. Recurring licenses on that type of stuff. So, yes, they, you know, they don't. They still have Doc Savage, don't they? Yeah, as well as yeah. the Shadow. So, yeah. you know, if if you ever get around to it, you know, I think there'll be a home for it. You know, in the hearts of fans. You know, so. <laughs> well, I hope so. I'm 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 holding out. Uh, I'm holding out hope um, that at some point, maybe in retirement, I'll just sit down and and uh, bang out a uh, strong man as as it's my ancient opus. <laughs> in my fading years, um, but you know, it's 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 a project close to my heart, and maybe it'll happen someday. Uh, I hope it does. Oh yeah, I, I well, I'll keep the hope for you as well. So, <laughs> excellent, excellent. Hey guys, that concludes my conversation with comic book artist John Bogdanov. Thanks so much for taking a listen to this first episode of Artist Proof Redux. And if you really liked what you saw here and what you heard here, definitely take a chance and like, share, and subscribe here on YouTube on the Anosm Studios channel. Also, we have a Patreon page that is now available and taking subscriptions. Uh, for just $1 a month, that's all we ask. For just $1 a month, uh, you can definitely help us out and keep these videos coming. Um, we also have uh, content on the Patreon page, such as you know exclusive material that's not available here on the YouTube page as far as videos, uh, also um, articles, um, how-to tutorials, just, just, a, just a lot of stuff. And we have some more fresh stuff coming uh, very soon. So definitely, if you want to help out at Nazem Studios in a financial way for just $1 a month, definitely consider contributing to our Patreon page. And that's patreon.com forward slash Studios. And we also have 
a home page, which is inazmastudios.com. Go there and you can buy original art made by yours truly, as well as other articles and the original artist proof episodes as presented are all available on the website. So definitely check out inazmastudios.com. That's our main hub for everything Inazma Studios. Take care. I'll catch you guys later.